Well, welcome to the AO North America Internet Live Public and Tabular Management Course. Uh, today is the second of an eight-week uh, course on sequential Saturdays for 90 minutes. These are our chairman, and uh, my name is David Stephen, and I'll be moderating the session today on behalf of uh, Dr. Stephen Sims and Dr. Mark Riley, the co-chairs. This uh, is a course that was uh, established and uh, born out of the COVID pandemic. It's been modeled after the osteotomy course that uh, was very successful uh, and completed just recently. The hope is to have a face-to-face -face course uh, in 2021, early in, in 2021. These lectures that uh, will be given uh, today in the following weeks will be uh, recorded and available on AO Trauma North America and we'll come back to that uh, after the completion of today just to give you some more information about that and CME will be offered uh, for this. This is our excellent faculty that you'll hear from uh, over the uh, eight weeks of the course. Today we have uh, four excellent speakers, Brett Christ, James Leonard, Connor Clarino and Raymond White. These are their disclosures. The learning objectives today will include uh, decision-making strategies for the management of pelvic ring injuries, the indications for operative management, and looking at surgical approaches, reduction techniques, and fixation options in pelvic ring injuries. And next week, we'll have uh, more in-depth case, pres case presentation through expert panel from the faculty. So this is the outline of today. Uh, Brett Chris will be talking about indications for surgery. James Leonard will be talking about anterior pelvic ring uh, uh, fixation, reduction. Connor Colino will be talking about sacroiliac joint dislocations and fracture dislocations. And finally, Ray White will be talking about sacral fractures, including uh, some information on uh, spinal pelvic fixation. We'll have an opportunity at the end of these uh, four talks for question and answer and wrap up uh, with regards to uh, any uh, discussion points that come up from the talks as a lead in for next week with regards to case discussion. Your microphones have been turned off. Please use the Q&A function, the question and answer function for questions related to this, uh, these talks. We will uh, collate them uh, and uh, have an opportunity at the completion of the four talks to address the questions. Please do not use the chat, chat function um, for uh, today and going forward for the, the remainder of the weeks. So with that in mind, I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, pass over to uh, Brett for the first talk. Thanks, Dave. Uh, good morning. And we're gonna talk about uh, indications for surgery, uh, extent and order of fixation. And so we'll go through a couple of cases that I want you to think about while we're moving through the, the information. So this is a 32 year old who was in a motor vehicle crash, had a right sided pneumothorax and rib fractures. And these are her plain radiographs. And just to have an obturator oblique view because of the uh, uh, pubic root fracture. Here's her CT, axial CT scan. And here's the second case. So this is a 19 year old who's uh, six weeks pregnant, uh, status post motor vehicle crash and had a, had a left sided pneumothorax with some rib fracture. So slightly different injury pattern as you can see here on our plain radiographs. And this is her CT scan axial cuts. And so think about what you'd want to do with both of those cases as we go through this. Uh, so my learning objectives are to list the indications for operative management of pelvic ring injuries, recognize when to use anterior and or posterior fixation strategies, and then determine the order of fixation because it does uh, matter, obviously. 
And so these are historical indications for operative management, which basically comes down to having an unstable pelvic ring injury. So if they're hemodynamically unstable and the pelvis is the source of bleeding, open fractures, uh, some rotationally unstable injuries, vertically unstable, uh, combination pattern, historically posterior ring displacement greater than 10 millimeters, pubic symphysial diastasis greater than 20 or 2.5 centimeters, rami fracture displacement at least 1.5 centimeters, associated acetabular fractures, and then polytraumas are excused to do uh, everything always. Um, and potentially your skill is also one of the indications as far as, you know, do you take care of it or do you send it to somebody who's uh, more experienced at it? And so what does displacement mean? Uh, and this is a slide uh, from Tanya Ferguson. You can see that you can get distracted with this central acetabular fracture dislocation on the left, uh, but there's a lot of displacement in the uh, pelvic ring. And so the long-term effects of displacement and malunion in the pelvis is not really well um, borne out in at least prospective data. Um, future problems can be leg link discrepancy, sitting imbalance, chronic pain, and difficulties with um, having a baby or pregnancy, depending on the size of the child. Um, and this is uh, basically a, a paper by uh, Kelly uh, at al., Kelly Lefebvre at al., who looked at what outcomes are important uh, for using pelvic ring functional outcome scores. And they looked at the kind of the most prominent three ones that are out there, including the Majeed score, and none really correlated uh, there was the Iowa score as well as the Orlando score. There was no mental or emotional component because they also compared to the um, musculoskeletal functional assessment, the short form, uh, and the S SFA. Uh, and they concluded that really something better was needed to kind of incorporate the, the mental and emotional uh, problems with having a pelvic ring injury because they are life-changing injuries. And so how do we measure displacement? Plain films, it can be difficult to see posterior ring displacement, as you can see here on this right-sided sacral fracture. Uh, CT scans are obviously helpful, as you can see, that's the same patient um, that you can see that's better visualization about the fracture pattern as well as displacement. And then this is a different patient, but you can see that the surface rendered uh, 3D reconstructions and 2D reconstructions that you get can be helpful. So this is another paper by a similar group from Vancouver that looked at three common ways of measuring pelvic displacement that's been recorded in the literature. And uh, this is actually one that they uh, came up with called the absolute displacement method. It does require a lot of measurements, six measurements on three of the plane films and AP inlet and outlet views. And then the last one uh, for displacement was the inlet and outlet ratio measurement that uh, Cloud Saji described. They also looked at the reduction uh, evaluation that Mata and Tornetta um, published. And their conclusion from that was that pelvic displacement measurements were not, have not been validated. There was a lot of inter-observer agreement that was poor for all methods. And they didn't really look at intra-observer uh, correlation. They did conclude that the Saji method was reliable for wide displacement only. And so operative indications, this is obviously a no-brainer. I mean, there's nobody, uh, at least I don't think there would be anybody that would treat this non-operatively. So what about this one? This one, it's even hard to see on the plain films where the potential injury is, but she does have a, a small right-sided sacral fracture that's really not displaced. And I'll try, this is unfortunately went very fast, so I'll try to slow it down here. And you can see that she has, uh, zone one fracture that does uh, get close to the frame in there. And then, uh, so non-operative management can be used for complete or incomplete sacral fractures with minimal comminution, minimal displacement, and, and really in this one, there was no anterior ring displacement. And so this is what her post-mobilization films look like, and there really was no change. Uh, so she was successfully treated non-operatively. But there's, there's gray areas, and that's usually in an LC1 pattern. And so uh, Kelly Lefebvre and, and et al. looked at, you know, what exactly constitutes uh, a LC1 type fracture. And there's a lot of variation in what that injury pattern looks like. Uh, and then there's also more prospective studies that uh, Tornetta's group published that looked at, particularly looking at uh, LC1 
injuries and Dr. Rout was on uh, one of these papers at least as well, a large group of folks that take care of pelvis fractures. And so, you know, does fixing an LC1 really help with pain management or are there really clear indications? Uh, and there, the conclusion of that paper was that there wasn't. So this is a minimally displaced LC1 with a complete sacral fracture. This is the uh, CT scan showing that the sacrum does have some anterior comminution. And then what about those with anterior ring displacement and comminution? So the benefits of non-operative management is obviously avoid the risk of surgery. Um, the potential risk, there is a potential risk of late displacement, which can make the surgery more difficult depending on how much displacement you have. Um, the benefits of operative, you know, we talked about polytrauma as being one of those indications for you know, maybe that lets you weight bear them early on that extremity or that allows them to weight bear when they wouldn't otherwise be able to if that's the way you're treating that specific patient. You know, does it improve pain? Um, is it easier for them to get around? You potentially avoid late displacement or decrease that risk. Um, you do have the risk of surgery and you do have the risk of hardware failure and further surgery. If screws back out or, or plates break, that sort of thing. So what about exam uh, under anesthesia? X-rays and CT scans are static images. It's been shown to be effective for acetabular fracture management. So this is a paper that Dr. Saji published on uh, one of the techniques of doing it. So these are different uh, stress exam techniques that the figures are showing here. And this is their paper. They looked at 68 pelvis fractures. They had 14 that were quote unquote uh, classified as an APC1. When they went to the OR and examined them, they actually uh, had 50% of them become APC2s that went on to fixation. And this is a patient that I was concerned that had potential, it was a, a qualified as an APC1, but I thought it would be beneficial to uh, do an examination under anesthesia. Um, they also looked at uh, 23 APC2s and 57% of those, they reclassified as 2As and 2Bs. And then they actually had uh, only one of them that they reclassified as an APC1. So this, this particular patient of mine was stable. They didn't open up posteriorly and the symphysis didn't go beyond uh, basically two centimeters. So then they looked at LC1s, there were 19 of those and 37% of them uh, were positive for stress exam and uh, went on to, they classified them as a LC1B and went on to surgery. Uh, eight of them were LC2s that were 63% were unstable. And then they actually had four LC3s, which um, I'm not sure many of us would do just to plan on just a stress exam, but 100% um, of them were unstable, which would be expected based on the fracture pattern. So this is the APC stress view for that patient and the front and the back uh, imaging showing that stress. So this is another one. Um, from um, multiple authors at different facilities looking at the benefits of a negative stress exam uh, as regarding, with regards to union without further displacement. So this was retrospective that was a relatively small number of patients, 34 that they had LC1, two and then APC1 patterns. Um, and there was no significant difference for displacement at final follow-up and all fractures uh, united. So let's move on to uh, operative techniques. Uh, we're gonna get more detail from uh, these fine young gentlemen. Uh, James is gonna talk about the anterior ring. Connor is gonna talk about SI dislocations and fracture dislocation. And then Ray, uh, Ray is gonna talk about sacral fractures in general. So the goals of reduction, uh, I think we all try to strive for anatomical reduction, but what is an acceptable malreduction? Um, definitely the joints, so SI joints, if you don't get it reduced, it increases your failure rate significantly. You know, is it key to get the rami's perfect? Um, you know, do we try to aim for less than five millimeters? Um, symphysis, if you don't get it right, um, a poor reduction goes on to failure. And the joints are the most difficult, especially correcting for vertical displacement and flexion, uh, flexion and extension deformity. So anterior only or anterior than posterior. So these are the injuries that I think of that you can go anterior only or anterior than posterior. So an APC2 injury where the still the hinge is intact posteriorly with the posterior ligaments. Um, and these are purely rotational injuries. 
And so this is uh, a CT scan of that patient with a binder on. And you can see that at least the left side of SI joint is open in the front. And so it went on to heal with uh, just a plating in the front. Uh, sometimes, depending on if there's uh, a flexion or extension deformity to the hemipelvis, uh, I would add a uh, sacroiliac screw like you see here. And so there was a published paper on this um, out of Tampa and, uh, and uh, Vanderbilt. They looked at uh, 42 anterior only platings and then 92 combined. And there was a significant difference uh, in failure rates with those that were treated with anterior fixation only for both uh, fixation failure and malunion. And so, uh, you know, I think in, if there's any question, I think adding posterior fixation is beneficial. So how about posterior then anterior? Um, I think of that when posterior fractures are involved or SI joint displacement, including vertical displacement. So rotational and vertically unstable fractures. So this is a 22 year old motor vehicle uh, crash. It was car versus truck and they had a positive fast exam and they were hemodynamically unstable. Uh, so what did Dr. Kreider tell us? If you could please um, mute your mic, thanks. Um, so do we fix it? When do we fix it? You know, what do we do since they're hemodynamically unstable and what order of fixation? So this is uh, actually, Dr. Routes talked about a resuscitation screw. So this uh, patient wasn't stable after they did the exploratory laparotomy and the splenectomy. And so we went in and did um, an anterior uh, X-fix and then a posterior SI screw on the right side. And this is his post, um, post-op uh, CT scan uh, on the right there. And so four days later, went back for definitive fixation of the, re the remainder of his injuries, including a femur fracture. And so it is important to avoid residual displacement because it can affect your ability to safely put hardware in. So one of our chairs, Dr. Riley, uh, published this paper several years ago where they looked at six uh, cadaveric pelvises and they looked at a safe iliosacral screw placement based on the amount of displacement through the sacrum. So this is the diagram showing what the in, intact sacrum corridor looked like. And they varied the displacement between five and 20 millimeters. And so this is at 10 millimeters and greater than 10 millimeters, there was shown to be an increased risk of unsafe placement for the iliosacral screws or sacroiliac screws. So with one centimeter of displacement, 56% uh, of the placements would be compromised. And so now we can move to the uh, cases. So this is that 32 year old with the right side of pneumothorax and rib fractures. So outlet and inlet views. Again, just showing the right sided anterior ring injury. So here's her CT scan, which I thought she had a LC, minimally displaced LC2 fracture. And so what do you want to do? And so this is where I think um, potentially uh, an examiner anesthesia may be helpful. So these are the options that I thought you definitely could have a trial of non-operative management and get post-mobilization films. Um, you could get an examiner anesthesia and go from there or just plan on uh, fixing it. And I chose number two. Uh, so this is without stress. This is with stress. And it didn't significantly move, but I thought it moved enough to where I just had to do it. So put the LC2 screw in to create a stable hemipelvis and then connected that back to the uh, sacrum. And that's her imaging post-operatively. And she came back 22 months later, and this is what her final images look like, including flamingo views and showed no anterior instability. She did get a little HO on the left uh, abductors, uh, which um, didn't really make sense, but she may have been kind of, that may have been what's pinned, what was pinned under her with that mechanism of injury. So case number two, uh, this is a 19 year old who's six weeks pregnant, plain imaging. This is her CT scan. 
So I thought she had a lateral compression type three injury. And so how about order of fixation? Do you do the front first? Do you do the posterior first? Do you fix the left and right? Um, so these are some of the things that you need to think about. Uh, and so this is just, uh, they're gonna talk about different reduction methods, but this is what I use in this patient. It's percutaneous reduction, uh, commercially available thing called a star frame, uh, which I found helpful in some situations. So the right hemi pelvis was anchored to the table. Uh, and then using the reduction pins for both uh, anterior posterior control and uh, rotational control and flexion extension. Uh, internally rotated their left hemi pelvis and added a ball spike. And uh, put an SI screw first. And that's what it looked like with the anterior ring after the SI screw was placed. I like that reduction and had the left uh, anterior inferior iliac spine uh, LC2 type pin, so I couldn't put that screw first. So did a retrograde ramus screw on the left side and then took out the uh, chance pin and placed the LC2 screw. And then did a right SI screw, which her right SI joint wasn't necessarily that unstable, but I was concerned about her parasymphyseal injury on the right and thought that her uh, alignment was good. And because of her pregnancy, I didn't want to um, place hardware in the front um, uh, just because we'd be close to where the baby was, et cetera. And that may not, that may be faulty logic, but I wanted to support her anterior ring by fi com completely fixing the posterior ring because it would have required plating, I thought, in the front. I didn't think a ramus screw would be helpful. So th these are her post-operative images. Uh, and th this was done about six years ago. Today, I would have added a second uh, sacral corridor screw that was transiliac transsacral. This is at, at four months. She's weight variance tolerated. Uh, unfortunately, she lost the baby. Um, she's abulating without any assisted device. And so in summary, um, you know, the widely displaced pelvic ring injuries, those are easy ones to choose to fix, but the gray zone, the LC1 fractures um, may be difficult to decide sometimes. Uh, sometimes anterior and posterior ring fixation is needed. Uh, the order of fixation is based on the injury, and it is important to avoid uh, residual displacement. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. <clears throat> um, Mark, Steve, any questions while we're changing over to James' talk? Maybe while we're changing, maybe just uh, quickly. Uh, uh, you could answer the question. So it came up a couple of people with the uh, radiation exposure during pregnancy for percutaneous fixation. Does that uh, kind of weigh the risk and benefits of that? Uh, it's def definitely a concern. Um, I think it matters a lot as far as uh, what stage of pregnancy it is. Um, but as far as the kind of the protocol that we have in conjunction with the general surgery folks is that Early on, uh, definitely, um, you know, always the life of the mom is is uh, prioritized, um, and so it is more radiation. And unfortunately, you can't really place a lead apron underneath them or over the top of the abdomen. So just try to minimize exposure as much as possible. Um, that's the best answer I can give you. One other question uh, that has come up, and I know this will be somewhat addressed in the future, but uh, in a lateral compression pattern, um, what is the threshold for operative intervention in terms of internal rotation? How much internal rotation is acceptable for non-operative management and what triggers you to correct the deformity? Well, I definitely think uh, more than a centimeter uh, is definitely an indication for, unless it's a geriatric patient that um, you know, is symptom is minimally uh, symptomatic and isn't a good surgical candidate. That would be somebody where you, at least I would accept more deformity, but anybody who's not uh, in the geriatric age group, low energy age group, uh, I would consider uh, more than a centimeter, definitely. And I think that's what the paper from Tornetta's group uh, talked about. It's like, we don't have a great, uh, 
I guess, agreement on what is considered something to operate on. And so that's, I think, a challenge to everyone who does pelvic fracture surgery that we need to come up with more prospective trials to come up with a better answer. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll keep uh, looking at the questions and answers and some will be answered by the faculty. We'll uh, also collate some of the uh, questions for the discussion uh, section after the, the talks. And next speaker will be James Lerner talking about uh, anterior ring fixation. James? Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we're going to get started here talking about the anterior ring. So anterior pelvic ring is an important topic. Um, and as you've uh, hopefully seen in some of the other uh, lectures that this is a component of overall pelvic stability and we're going to talk about different options for how to deal with this. So first case to get you thinking, remember to focus on the anterior ring injury only. We're not going to talk about posterior ring fixation. Uh, this is a 25 year old male who is a high speed motorcycle collision. It came in and uh, this is one of the AP pelvis images we have. If you notice the clamps uh, that can you can probably deduce this person is in a circumferential wrap. Uh, and you can see that he has some residual anterior ring and even some posterior ring displacement. I want you to start thinking about what you might do to address this. And then we'll compare that to this 76 year old female who was a low energy fall from standing. So comparing some of the geriatric patterns that we get from the young high energy patterns and seeing how those differ. So keep those in mind and we'll come back to those in a little bit. So the objectives here, we want to talk about the different patterns of the anterior pelvic ring instability and how to construct a pre-op plan to reduce that pelvic displacement so we can restore the anatomy. And then finally, we're going to construct uh, a implants in a way that will maintain the stability in the anterior ring. So there's a lot of different patterns of a pelvic ring injury. Uh, we can have a pure symphysial injury. Uh, in the anterior ring that is no fractures associated with it uh, anteriorly. You can have uh, ramus fractures, and this can be unilateral, bilateral, segmental. Uh, it can be parasymphysial or in the root. It can be in the mid ramus, so a lot of different patterns available there. It can be in the association with an acetabular fracture, so you can have <clears throat> anterior ring injuries with associated uh, acetabular injuries, and then you can get combined injuries where you've got pelvic ring, acetabulum, uh, and other polytrauma as well. So there's lots of different patterns that we see. This is the Nakatani classification, which uh, you can read about, but it's just looking at the regions based on the obturator foramen. Medial is one, at the obturator foramen is two, and lateral is three. And that location and orientation will affect both their uh, likelihood that they will displace and also how easy it is for uh, fixation, a little bit different from the mechanism of injury. So uh, lower energy injuries versus higher energy injuries. Uh, these have different intrinsic stability and allows for uh, more or less easy fixation. So something to think about is not just if there is a ramus fracture, but exactly where and how it's oriented. And that can help you plan your fixation as well. So we learned in some of the previous sessions about different classifications. And obviously with AP compression injuries, we're gonna have diastasis or a widening of the anterior pelvic ring and in lateral compression injuries, we're gonna have a decrease of the pelvic volume and an internal rotation of the hemipelvis. And that's gonna create a different problem. Each one has its own associated issues. And we have these high energy vertical shear injuries. This can be something that's either an axial load, like a fall from height, or it can even be traction in someone that's thrown from a vehicle and be very careful about the associated injuries, both nerve avulsions and other stretch injuries and then intimal tears and frank vascular disruption with these axial uh, traction injuries in a vertical shear. There's also some uncommon patterns such as a locked symphysis in the left here or some of these highly unstable combined patterns with a lot of translation and uh, you know iliac fractures that are complex in addition to the anterior ring. So there's lots of different patterns and when we're going to approach these generally we're going to use some sort of an anterior uh, midline approach. Now for the isolated injuries when they haven't yet had a midline, the fan and steel skin incision on the left here is usually a little bit more cosmetic because it runs in Langer's lines. It's relatively uh, easily done and then a longitudinal midline through the deep interval 
If someone's had a laparotomy already in the midline, you may not want to create a fan and steel perpendicular to that. And so you can just extend that midline down distally, a little bit less cosmetic in the long run compared to an isolated fan and steel, but that's something that can be extended if they have a pre-existing abdominal incision there. The deep interval for the anterior ring is relatively straightforward, although it can be quite challenging depending on the anatomy. You're gonna go into the linea alba between the two heads of the rectus abdominis. And it's important to try to stay outside of the peritoneal cavity. You're gonna dissect the bladder carefully off the posterior aspect of the symphysis and the anterior pelvic ring. And knowing ahead of time that they have a Foley catheter to decompress that bladder, and knowing ahead of time if they have an associated urethral or bladder injury, so that you know what to expect when you go in there and you're not surprised by a bladder disruption into your uh, surgical field. You're gonna then elevate the rectus abdominis from its insertion on the pubis. You're gonna work from posterior to anterior and from midline to lateral. And with a significant ring injury, especially the anterior posterior compression patterns, you're gonna have more likely a disruption at least of one side of the rectus abdominis. So it's careful to elevate that so we can repair it on our closure to avoid herniation risks. Different reduction tricks, there's a lot of different options available. Uh, when you look on it from an anterior, uh, excuse me, from an inlet view perspective, uh, you're gonna be seeing that anterior to posterior translation. And here you can see a clamp placed to help reduce that widening and show that there's no anterior to posterior malreduction when you're putting that clamp on. When you look at it from an outlet view, and here you can see the tine placement on the pubic bodies just inferior to the pubic tubercles, this can be, um, done not only with a large uh, pointed reduction tenaculum like this, you can also use some of these uh, screw-based clamps like a Youngbluth or a Farabuff clamp. And these can allow not only to bring those uh, pubic bodies together from lateral to medial, but you can also, as you see on the left there, uh, rotate the clamp using the screws as a foundation and a point of fixation in order to, to fix some of the flexion extension. Um, and that can also be applied in other areas of the pelvis as shown on the illustration on the right there. So there's a lot of different ways you can move these clamps around and it's just careful exposure and then a good plan ahead of time so that you don't place these clamps in a position that will then be in the way of your definitive fixation. For the lateral compression injuries, we saw in some of the other talks, Dr. Rout talked about making a reduction uh, and that will allow for a greater uh, sized fixation pathway. So your reduction and stabilization of the anterior ring in some of these lateral compression injuries, it may facilitate your posterior reduction and placing fixation. Uh, and then a lot of times the question is about weight bearing restrictions in the anterior ring injuries. It's something you wanna uh, restrict their weight bearing, it's something that you're gonna let them uh, bear weight on early. Uh, and there's a lot of rotational forces as we bear weight through the lower extremities <clears throat> and posterior fixation is subject to all that force as it transmits the body weight from the torso to the lower extremities. And sometimes anterior ring reduction and then stabilization uh, can neutralize some of the forces on the posterior ring. So that's important to consider if your posterior fixation is not gonna be robust enough on its own. For the anterior posterior compression patterns, you can think about this and uh, depending on the pattern, you can sometimes uh, be successful with isolated anterior fixation, uh, getting a good reduction and placing plates and screws. Uh, if it is ineffective at completely reducing it, you may find uh, that posterior fixation is something where that's going to add a compressive force across the back of the ring and that's going to reduce the posterior ring uh, completely and get a nice stable construct. So Sometimes you're able, if the soft tissues are still intact in an APC type two pattern with an intact posterior SI ligament, you can uh, potentially treat the patient effectively with only anterior fixation. But if it's not reducing, then uh, posterior fixation may be required. There's a lot of other options for anterior fixation um, and it runs the gamut. So uh, here's a patient that was treated with only posterior fixation. Uh, you can see that they have two transiliac transsacral screws. Uh, and on this outlet view, you can see that there is not uh, any cranial displacement. Uh, and in this patient, the, the choice was made to avoid anterior incisions and just place posterior fixation. 
You can use an external fixator to stabilize the anterior ring. This is especially helpful in very comminuted or parasymphysele injuries where you uh, feel that there's a relative contraindication to open reduction and internal fixation. That could be because of an indwelling uh, suprapubic tube. That could be from uh, a high energy injury, an open abdomen, um, or other uh, contraindications where you might not want to make a new incision if they have a bad wound or a pre existing infection uh, someplace <clears throat> that you wouldn't want to place implants. Uh, Percutaneous screws can be used in the anterior pelvic ring. Um, that's something that can be uh, placed either retrograde, as this patient was shown, or antegrade. Um, these are technically challenging, but can be very helpful in providing stability to the anterior ring. Uh, in this patient, they had fractures on the right of the, in zone two, right at the mid ramus, and on the left, it was a little more towards the root. And by placing these medullary superior pubic ramus screws, we were able to maintain the reduction of the anterior ring and then later stabilize that in the posterior ring. If you don't want to leave an external fixator, you may have heard about an internal fixator. Uh, this is one of the different versions of this. Uh, in this case, it's placed using uh, pedicle screw implants designed for the spine and you can create a pathway just like you would place an anterior inferior iliac spine pin for an external fixator and you'd use the exact same corridor of bone along the pelvic brim placing it in the same way using obturator outlet views and inlet views in order to get the correct trajectory. And then the bar connecting the two pins is tunneled across the subcutaneous tissues. Um, there's a lot of technical issues with this and there's lots of papers you can read on it, but making sure the bar does not pass through the peritoneum, making sure that the screws are prominent so that you do not compress the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And these are uh, highly associated with heterotopic bone formation. So Something to consider in patients, but it's, it's got its own drawbacks like many of our other fixation techniques. And then finally, the old faithful open reduction and internal fixation. Here's an older plate, but same technique, reducing the anterior pelvic ring and then plating it in compression in order to maintain the anatomy of the pelvic ring. So lots of different options for fixation. Um, if you're gonna do an open reduction like we talked about, it's gonna be through that anterior midline uh, interval. So let's talk about our cases. We got our high energy young motorcycle patient here on the left hand side and our low energy 75 year old on the right hand side. And for the young man with the APC type injury who's in a circumferential wrap and has residual deformity, we're going to focus on the anterior ring. And this patient was resuscitated overnight and was taken to the operating room for an open reduction. And here a clamp is placed across the pubic bodies and is reduced down. You can see on this inlet view that the reduction is got no residual anterior to posterior translation and then a plate and screw construct was placed in compression with nice long screws. The midline screws are diverging towards the uh, towards the inferior rami. The secondary screws are working midline uh, to get nice long cortical bite and then the Final most lateral screws are aiming, avoiding any soft tissues, so you don't want to be long as you're in the obturator foramen, and that's a nice stable anterior ring construct. For this patient, we got a little preview earlier, but this is a geriatric injury, uh, low energy fall. She was having significant pain and immobility, and so using a similar fan and steel approach, an open reduction was performed, but the fixation was percutaneous, and on this obturator outlet view, you can see the large fragment uh, self-tapping screw that was placed through her relatively small corridor, just cranial to her right acetabulum. And as we placed that screw, we got good stability on the patient's right side. And so we thought one good turn to nerves another. And we were able to place a similar screw on the patient's left side. And she ended up with bilateral medullary superior pubic ramus screws placed retrograde through an open incision, uh, but a relatively minimally invasive fixation. Um, and with good medullary support for this poor uh, geriatric bone where I thought that uh, plating her from retroacetabular surface to retroacetabular surface was gonna be a much bigger dissection and a, a less rewarding fixation. So here's their final constructs uh, on the young man. Uh, we'll get, learn a bit, a little bit about posterior fixation later on. And so you can think about how you might address his posterior ring in addition to this anterior ring reduction. And on the geriatric patient, this is a stress view showing maintained reduction of her 
uh, pubic ramus fractures. You can see that the screws are bending there with our stress, but resisting the forces of internal rotation. So we felt confident this is something she could start to weight bear on. So here we've got a lot of different patterns of pelvic ring instability. Planning to reduce the displacement reduction tools that can be done open, that can be closed with me with an external fixator, and then constructs to maintain stability that determines um, both our overall weight bearing. We're basing that on bone quality, we're basing that on fracture patterns, and our ability to place implants safely. So with that, we'll turn it back over. Thanks, Jay. Answer any questions. Yeah, James. So uh, just. Uh quickly, and maybe we'll come back to this in the, in the group discussion at the end of the talks, but just uh, there seems to be really recurrent uh, questions about bladder injuries and suprapubic catheters. Does that change your idea about fixation and strategies with regards to timing and so forth? Can you address that just kind of briefly? Yeah, the so, so that's a great question because you're gonna see this a lot and depending on the urology team that you've got associated with you, you may be dealing with someone who is a fan of late reconstruction of bladder and urethral injuries. And so if suprapubic catheters are something that we see a lot. Um, there's some evidence to show that it's uh, not something you need to worry about. That being said, an indwelling uh, uh, percutaneous tube like that can be a pathway for contamination and depending on the exact position of that suprapubic tube and the sterility with which it was placed, uh, you may have the opportunity for some contamination to make its way down to your fixation. So early on in someone who may have a, a disruption where a primary realignment using a retrograde and anagrade uh, cystoscopy with passing of a wire and then a a uh, cannulated catheter can sometimes be done and that way you've got a primary realignment. Only about 10 to 20% of the time does that actually work long term for actual urethral function, but it can minimize the risk of a suprapubic tube. At my institution, I cannot get them to do that. And so we deal with suprapubic tubes for bladder disruptions and we try to make it as far away as possible uh, from the actual pubis so that we can minimize the risk of contamination making its way from the suprapubic tube to the pelvic implants. I have at least one patient with a bad history of osteomyelitis from an indwelling suprapubic tube. So I definitely am a little gun shy, but the evidence does say that it's okay. It's not ideal. All right. Thanks, James. Maybe we'll, we'll come back uh, with the faculty that are online and we'll uh, maybe revisit that uh, question, but that's uh, great information. Thank you very much. So uh, the next speaker will be uh, Connor Cloino from Seattle talking about uh, posterior ring injuries, specifically sacroiliac joint uh, dislocations and fracture dislocations. Connor. Great. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone from Seattle, Washington. I'll be talking today about the uh, primarily sacroiliac joint disruptions and uh, fixation of that. So here's a first case example, obviously a dramatic sacroiliac disruption. Uh, this is a mortal injury, obviously, but most of what you'll see uh, with the sacroiliac disruptions is much more subtle than this. The objectives I have for you today is first to talk about percutaneous iliosacral lag screw reduction for these injuries, and then to talk a little bit about open anterior reduction. So SI joint disruptions can occur in all patterns of pelvic ring injuries. So for example, in APC injuries where it's most often considered, you can get a disruption either partial or complete of the SI joint. You can get it in vertical shear patterns like this, which are typical, typically complete disruptions of the SI joint. And you can also get it in lateral compression uh, injuries where it's often in the form of a fracture disruption or fracture dislocation with some small amount of residual posterior ilium still intact uh, with the sacrum. So just to make a comment on this, it, it really is whether you're talking about APC injuries or vertical shear or lateral compression, it's, it's a continuum of ligamentous disruption and ligamentous instability, just as in any other soft tissue injury. So the original classification may have described certain ligaments that may be torn at certain times to describe the classification, but 
just have in the back of your mind that the injuries don't necessarily follow the textbooks and you can have a continuum of partial injury or complete injury to one or more all of the uh, ligamentous complex structures that provide the stability of the SI joint. So along those lines, it's important to recognize the severity or at least presume the severity of an SI joint injury. You want to avoid something like this. This is a case uh, sent to me from another surgeon uh, within a month after injury. And you can see that uh, there was essentially an unrecognized severity of posterior or, or of a SI joint injury. So this, this C-type injury, this vertical shear injury was managed with a single iliosacral screw and the frame in the front. And you see the patient's left with uh, you know, substantial deformity and instability. So we want to avoid this. Along those same lines, this, this was another patient sent to me uh, quite long after an APC type injury or perhaps a vertical shear injury, but, but there was an unrecognized amount of ligamentous disruption in the SI joint on the left, and the patient was treated with anterior only fixation, and this, this was insufficient uh, fixation, and the patient's left with uh, quite a bit of deformity here. So. I, I guess I would argue that if it's an APC2, what you think, you better be right, because if you're wrong, you can definitely have problems with late instability of these patterns. So the first question that comes to mind once you decide that there's, this is an operative injury is, is whether you're going to do some sort of percutaneous lag screw reduction or, or an open reduction. And we'll talk a little bit about this, but I would uh, get in your mind that if you have a pelvic ring that's mostly aligned, like this image on the left, then often you can treat these with a percutaneous lag screw reduction. If you have uh, more deformity of the ring as this image on the right, you can imagine even if you clamp that symphysis, you may still have some residual cranial displacement of that SI joint, depending on how soon after the injury you're doing your surgery. So just to put in your mind that the, the reduction that you're able to obtain um, you know, or the, the amount of displacement in the pelvic ring may drive your uh, surgical uh, approach. So let's start with something relatively simple, but I think is uh, also quite common. So here's a gentleman, 50 year old male in a motorcycle crash. Uh, he has multiple injuries. As you know, pelvic ring injuries don't happen in isolation. So this gentleman had uh, blunt head trauma, blunt thoracic trauma. Uh, he was critically ill in the ICU. You see his pelvic ring when this uh, AP ghosted image on the right. Uh, he has a fracture disruption of the SI joint with a uh, sort of crescent type residual posterior iliac uh, fracture and an obturator ring fracture on the right. But overall, his pelvis is pretty well aligned. On the inlet and outlets, you can see the same thing. Of note, he has morbid obesity. So for me, I bring this up just in fact that it may make open reductions more difficult. So what are our treatment options? So we can do uh, an open reduction uh, through an anterior approach. We could do an open reduction through a posterior approach. You see on this 3D modeled image that he has pretty good reach along the posterior ilium and iliac crest. But again, as we said, he, he's a polytrauma patient. He's quite sick and he has morbid obesity uh, and not to mention a pretty significant contusion on his left flank from the, uh, from the injury. So in this one, I would advocate, uh, given the minimal pelvic ring deformity, uh, that we're gonna attempt a lag screw reduction. Pelvis is overall pretty well aligned. And when we go through our imaging, including our axial CTs, we'll see that there's a linear reduction vector for the reduction of our SI joint. So when I'm looking at my axial CTs on this patient, I'm asking myself a couple questions. Am I going to be able to get screw, uh, screw capture of the unstable segment back into the intact sacrum? And at what levels? Am I gonna get it at the first sacral segment, at the second sacral segment? Maybe I can add two screws here. And also, is there a linear reduction vector for my lag screw such that as I compress this down, is it going to provide a reduction maneuver? And the answer to both of these questions in this patient's case is, is yes. He has safe corridors with the current alignment and I'm going to get capture of the unstable segment. So here we are intraoperatively. Notice that my guide wire is going to be orthogonal to the SI joint if possible, because again, I'm providing a linear reduction vector with this lag screw. And then as I compress this, I'm going to reduce the SI joint. 
Okay, so preoperative planning of my safe corridors, which we've talked about last week, as well as preoperative planning of the angle of attack, so to speak, of these lag screws. All right, here's his final fixation. Here's our post-operative CT scan. And here's this uh, six month follow-up. Overall well-aligned ring, it's not anatomic, but not perceptible to him and he, he's doing well. Let's take a step up in terms of severity of injury to the SI joint. Here's another uh, patient, a motorcycle crash came in and I would probably describe this if I had to, to be at APC three injury, I think the right SI joint has a complete disruption. So you can see given the amount of displacement there, as well as a complete symphyseal disruption, the clamp you see on the right uh, indicates this patient is in a circumferential sheet wrap. So again, the question becomes, uh, are we gonna do an open erection of that right SI joint? I think that most people would treat this operatively. So we're going to do an open or a percutaneous reduction of this right SI joint. So I asked myself, is there a linear reduction vector or can I obtain a linear reduction vector for that SI joint? If so, perhaps a percutaneous lag screw reduction will be uh, sufficient. If not, then I would need to open this uh, uh, approach. Regardless, don't be afraid to open to get an anatomic reduction if you need. So here is his corresponding axial cuts on his CT. I see I have a very nice linear reduction vector for a lag screw. Here's an intraoperative inlet showing the same thing. For these injuries, my approach is typically to open the front and at least clamp the symphysis. I think that can act as a hinge point and have also an indirect reduction of the uh, corresponding SI joints. Uh, and at this point, I then reevaluate uh, the alignment of the SI joint to determine if it is aligned sufficiently that a lag screw will reduce this. In this one, I felt it was, so I've, I've done an open reduction as James uh, described and clamped the uh, symphysis. This is temporary to act as a hinge point and also provide some indirect reduction of the right SI joint. The alignment of the joint on the outlet looks good. And I have a linear reduction vector for a lag screw. On the inlet, I see the same thing both aligned on these planes except for the displacement lateral as well as a linear reduction vector for my lag screw. Now obviously there's a limit here and a couple of uh, commentary uh, points. You need to calculate how much displacement you have of this SI joint when you're sizing your screw so that you don't penetrate the contralateral side of the sacral ala. So just be mindful of that and also just recognize that the primary uh, uh, good bone quality in the sacrum is centrally. So you need to understand that if you have a joint that's, that has displacement of more than a centimeter, you're starting to limit the fact of how much uh, compression you can provide with a lag screw. So just calculate these in and be mindful of, of, of the amount of displacement you're trying to overcome to reduce the SI joint. So here we are on the inlet intraoperatively, compressing the joint. Now, uh, SI joints, similar to a syndesmosis, have a, a variation in shape. And I'll tell you that the more concavity you have may be uh, more easy to reduce or more difficult to reduce, depending on uh, the displacement patterns. But here you see where you have a nice linear reduction vector and are reducing the SI joint. Here's his final construct. And here's his postoperative CT with an acceptable reduction. So I would say the overwhelming majority of SI joint injuries uh, are either partial or complete with minimal uh, displacement and can often be uh, reduced and stabilized with percutaneous sacral lag screws. Uh, that's not always the case. And so don't be afraid to do uh, open reductions when indicated. So when are they indicated? So uh, as I mentioned before, perhaps it may be the case where even if you clamp the symphysis, you still have a multiplanar deformity of your SI joint. And in these cases, uh, particularly vertical shear type injuries where you have residual cranial displacement of the SI joint or of the ilium relative to the sacrum would be indicated for an open reduction. It may be the case where you have a combined acetabulum fracture where you'll be in, an, uh, in a surgical approach that will give you access to the SI joint, such as this injury, where we have uh, sort of simultaneous clamping of the transverse as well as the SI joint at the same time. 
Other situations where you've done an iliosacral screw percutaneous uh, reduction attempt and it wasn't uh, adequate, you see here um, a pelvic ring with a half of a pelvic ring with a left SI joint where I see still a residual uh, um, sort of a malreduction of the SI joint with an iliosacral screw across it. You may ask yourself why that happened. Well, when he came in, he looked like this, and this is a gentleman that had a fight with an, it was a logger who had an industrial fight, or a fight with an industrial conveyor belt. And so when he came in, he looked like this, and just like Dr. Rout's lecture from last week, we were just trying to obtain some stability of that left hemipelvis with a resuscitation screw. So you may, you may go back and revise this uh, later when the patient's more stable if your percutaneous reduction was not adequate. And of course, lastly, lastly, it may just be surgeon preference for percutaneous versus open approaches. So here's another example. Remember I said that uh, the SI joint can also be disrupted in lateral compression injury. So here's a 23-year-old female with a right SI joint disruption from a lateral compression injury. She has a symphyseal disruption, a left obturator ring fractures. She had an open vaginal injury with a bladder rupture as well. Here's her inlet and outlet views. Here's the axial cuts from her CT scan showing her disruption of the right SI joint and what looks like an intact left SI joint. So I would just caution you when, when you're interpreting your uh, static films, uh, including your CT scan, that you can miss or not appreciate occult SI joint injuries. This is pretty well documented. So one thing you can try for re reduction um, if you do not have uh, the SI joint aligned well is a, uh, a you know, percutaneous pins. Uh, Brett described the sort of a frame that you can attach to the table and pull and push, et cetera. So you can have a disruption that's shown here on the right, complete disruption of this SI joint. Place a, a, a pin into the buttress and try to reduce it. But in this case, even with that attempt, we were still off. I didn't feel like a screw here, or I felt the screw here would still leave her with the residual malreduction of the SI joint. So in those cases, uh, we're going to do an open reduction of the SI joint. For me, I, I prefer an anterior approach. Uh, a couple of reasons for that. One is it uh, allows me to, or primarily allows me to have uh, simultaneous control of the symphysis or ramus fractures that, as I discussed before, can act as a hinge point and may offer some indirect reduction of the SI joint. So for me, primarily, I, I prefer an anterior approach to the SI joint. And that's just through the same lateral window that you, you would use, similar to an uh, ilioinguinal approach. And this is the uh, sort of the border of visualization that you can see through this iliac window. If you want more access, you can just open the inguinal canal as if you're doing an ilioinguinal. You can extend it caudal as an iliofemoral approach. Uh, some people like to talk about ASIS osteotomy, so you can do something like that as well. So this is what it looks like. Any sort of clamp you want to use, but typically one tine is on the anterior lateral sacrum and the other tine is posteriorly. Obviously, you got to be mindful of the gluteal neurovascular bundle. And this is what it looks like on the inlet view. Mindful, again, of the L5 nerve root running cranial to caudal and medial to lateral coming off the, uh, the, the trunk. And make sure that you are visualizing placing this clamp onto the sacrum and that you are lateral to the L5 nerve root. You want to place your clamp so that you do not block your screw access once you've clamped your SI joint. And again, be mindful of that L5 nerve root as you place this clamp tine onto the anterior lateral sacrum. All right, and this is what it looks like on the inlet. Again, you're going to evaluate your reduction both on the inlet and the outlet. You'll see the SI joint um, and uh, plan the clamp placement, hopefully, to avoid blocking your screw uh, access. Uh, another way to do this is through a screw-based clamp. Uh, you're going to have one screw into the sacrum and one screw into the ilium. Again, be mindful of the L5 nerve root. Uh, depending on where you put this uh, uh, clamp tine, uh, anterior or posterior, you may need to be more lateral um, and just be uh, aware of this nerve root and uh, retract and place it safely in that lateral section. So this is what it looks like, and this is what it looks like intraoperative on an outlet view. One comment, make sure you plan out where your iliosacral screw fixation is gonna go. 
So in this case, we placed our screws for our screw base clamp quite anterior, and that allows for a uh, ilioseco screw to be placed posteriorly. So don't block your definitive fixation with the, uh, with the screw base clamp. You can also use a plate assisted reduction. So this is just a basic recon plate uh, on intraoperative inlet and outlet views. Um, typically there's room for only one screw into the sacrum and, and two screws into the ilium um, for this plate base. It can also be used for definitive fixation uh, if you need to. I would argue that just one single uh, recon plate uh, may not be sufficient for a complete SI joint injury. So if you're if you're uh, going to stabilize a complete SI joint injury, you'd probably argue for uh, adding in uh, iliosacral screws or at least two plates to stabilize that. Once you've got your reduction in your, in your, uh, of your SI joint, you're gonna wanna evaluate you know, the quality of your reduction. And I would say that this is one of the more difficult joints for us to truly uh, evaluate whether we have an anatomic reduction. But the best things we can do is uh, with our imaging on the Inlet view, we're gonna look at this anterior line. We wanna see that nice, smooth sort of Shenton's line of the anterior um, SI joint. And also look at the caudal facet of the SI joint on the AP and outlet views. So here's an example of a, a case where we uh, saw this caudal facet of the SI joint look disrupted and the corresponding CT scan shows just how much malreduction of the SI joint you have. So back to our patient. So this is our lateral compression injury. We saw a complete SI joint injury on the right side. We did stress the left side searching for an occult LC3 type injury and found a, uh, an occult injury of the left SI joint. So what she got was a percutaneous lag screw on the left side first to stabilize that uh, occult injury and then an open reduction of the right SI joint. Uh, and then in the front, we uh, treated her out with a frame given the open injury and bladder uh, ruptures, which James had mentioned. Here's her post-operative CT scan. Here's her healed follow-up. And then at two years, uh, she came back, she wanted her screws out. So a few discussion points that uh, frequently come up with uh, sacroiliac joint um, injuries. Uh, we went over percutaneous versus open reduction and why you might want to choose one versus the other. Uh, although there's options for plate fixation, really the workhorse I would advocate at this time is iliosacral screw fixation and whether that's one screw, two screws, three screws, uh, really the workhorse for me with fixation. And then the other uh, question that comes up commonly is do we take all the screws out or do we leave them in? Uh, in my practice, the overwhelming majority stay in. Um, once in a while we do take them out obviously in, in kids or adolescents, we are more sympathetic to removing those. And then in people who uh, really want them out, I'll, I'll offer removal if they, if they desire, but uh, not uh, just basically always take them out, but it's more of a case-by-case -case basis. So with that, I'd like to just repeat our objectives for the talk, to discuss percutaneous iliosacral lag, lag screw reduction and fixation, as well as the open uh, anterior reduction of the SI joint. Thank you. Thanks, Connor. Uh, one of the questions that came up was your concept of the linear, linear reduction vector. And one of the questions was, how do you assess that on the CT scan when you have significant displacement uh, in multiple planes? Yeah, gr great question. So uh, hopefully I was uh, implying by this is that you have a a screw and whether it's a lag by design or a lag by technique where you over drill the, the ilium, you, you're only going to do a linear reduction maneuver since it's just a screw. And so you have a, if you have a multiplanar deformity or displacement of the ilium relative to the sacrum, you're not going to be able to necessarily um, accommodate that with just a screw. So the evaluation is both, both on the preoperative x-rays, AP inlet outlet, as well as the CT scan. In addition, if you have a you know, concomitant symphyseal injury, then once you clamp that, you can again judge your reduction of your SI joint on AP inlet and outlet. Okay, great, thanks. I think there's a few other questions that uh, maybe we'll have time to discuss uh, in the group discussion. All right, so last speaker is uh, Ray White, right? And uh, he's gonna be talking to us about sacral fractures, great. All right, thank you very much. I'm just bringing up my lecture here. So we'll talk about sacral fractures is the other 
um, aspect of the posterior uh, pelvic ring, and, and we'll talk about classification and description of these fractures. We'll introduce options uh, for fixation and as well as reduction uh, of these fractures, and we'll emphasize the importance of the soft tissue envelope uh, when it comes to taking care uh, of these fractures. Remember what Dr. Adams talked to us about uh, last week in, in our uh, pelvic anatomy and, and the posterior aspect uh, of the pelvis is the sacrum. Uh, the innominate bones are rigidly connected by strong ligaments, uh, both anteriorly and posteriorly in the uh, sacroiliac uh, joints. Um, the, um, the sacrum is replete uh, with neurological structures and vascular structures that surround it. Uh, and understanding the osseous anatomy and its variations, I think, are very important. Dr. Rout talked to us about osseous fixation pathways uh, last week, and one of the things I'd like to highlight most, especially when it comes to uh, securing implants, uh, is that the sacral ala are relatively osteopenic uh, to the sacral body. Um, so uh, sometimes those are ineffective areas to be docking implants, especially uh, partially threaded screws. So the challenges to taking care of these patients are many, and some of our patients, the soft tissue envelope can be rather large, and in some of our patients, like this patient here that we see, the soft tissue envelope uh, can be injured. Um, there are large forces that are transmitted across our implants, and so we have to be uh, strategic uh, and powerful at the same time. The limited anatomical fixation uh, points that we talked about um, really are in reference to the osseous anatomy that's present in the safety zones that are present within them. The imaging can be really difficult and it, that can be operator dependent, it can be patient dependent. The reduction can sometimes be challenging and sometimes these patients are very, very sick uh, or in extremis uh, when, they, when they come in to see you. So how do we classify and how do we group these fractures? I think very broadly we can talk about uh, sacral fractures that involve the pelvic ring and then sacral fractures that are just inherent uh, to the sacrum. And, and um, um, I think as pelvic and acetabular surgeons, most of the time uh, we're talking about fractures that involve the pelvic ring, but we'll discuss fractures inherent to the sacrum as well. And so those fractures uh, that are part of the pelvic ring uh, can be uh, grouped, I think, in, in four different ways. Those that are minimally or non-displaced and stable, uh, those that are rotationally unstable, those that are vertically unstable, and, and those uh, fractures that lead to a lumbopelvic dissociation. Most of the time when we're talking about pelvic classification systems, we're talking about this one right here. I think um, most of us uh, at least have an idea uh, about this classification system of Denis, where we talk about zone ones, which are, which are uh, peripheral to the nerve root tunnel, zone twos, which go through the transforaminal zone and zone three fractures that go uh, medial uh, to the nerve root tunnel. Uh, this was a um, result of a series that was published in 1988 uh, and um, really had become uh, a mainstay of discussion when it comes to describing um, sacral fractures. Sometimes it's hard for me to uh, remember which is one, two, and three, and so I, I choose to be um, descriptive uh, when I'm talking about these, and, and instead of one, twos, or three, sometimes I'll use the words um, ailer, transferaminal, uh, or central. The central fractures can be subclassified um, by Roy Camille and then later, um, uh, later modified based on the angulation and displacement that may be present through these zone uh, three fractures. And beyond the uh, Roy Camille classification, uh, morphologic description can be, can be applied as well. Is it an H type or U type or lambdas or T's? And sometimes these can be really difficult uh, to make out even with some of our modern uh, imaging. This is uh, Ball Zizzler's um, um, classification system. Doesn't uh, get as much uh, publicity or press, or we don't talk about it as much as pelvic and acetabular surgeons, but I, I think it's a neat paper and a neat series published in 1990 uh, to demonstrate that you can have lumbopelvic uh, dissociation without having a midline fracture, and his classification system is based on the fractures um, relationship to the L5-S1 facet, and I've left the, the reference here if you're, if you're interested, and I'd challenge you to read a little bit about that um, just to fortify your um, education. And so what determines clinical management of the sacral fracture? And so for me, stability, uh, the amount of displacement, the presence of comminution, and then what's going on with the soft tissues? And when I talk about the soft tissues, I'm talking about skin and, and nerve roots uh, that may be injured. 
And so we'll just go through a few uh, cases, the rotationally stable fractures. Um, although this is an operative course and we all want to operate pelvic green fractures and, and sacral fractures, sometimes there is uh, room for closed treatment or non-operative care. And so uh, for me, ones that are rotationally and vertically stable, the mainstay of treatment is closed treatment. You can protect or allow these patients to weight bear as tolerated. And, and I think post-mobility x-rays are important. Here's an example of a patient that we just saw two weeks ago. And, and boy, if there was ever if ever there was a uh, patient that we thought was stable, it was this one. And, and this is an 18-year-old male who was in a motor vehicle crash. And, and when he came to the um, uh, trauma bay, he said that he hurt a little bit, but was able to ambulate at the scene. Uh, he had no pain and was stable on compressive exam. And, and here I'll just show you that he has this, this extra foraminal or ailer fracture uh, that I think some would refer to as a, as a buckle fracture with almost no displacement and minimal pain. And I think these are examples of sacral fractures uh, that can be uh, very safely treated uh, non-operatively. We ambulated him, um, and um, so far he is doing uh, quite well. For rotationally unstable fractures, um, you have to obtain a reduction. It's been stated multiple times so far in this course that, um, that reduction is a, is a very important point uh, when it comes to anything in the pelvic ring. And so reduction strategies can be many, and they can be closed or indirect or open and direct. Um, in the mainstay, at least in my practice, and I, I would say probably in North America is iliosacral screw fixation in these rotationally unstable fractures uh, that are part of the uh, pelvic ring. This is coupled uh, with anterior stabilization. I think James very nicely covered your anterior stabilization uh, options. Uh, but for me in my practice, um, when there is anterior uh, pelvic ring injury associated with the sacral fracture, um, usually those fractures are stabilized in addition to the posterior aspect. The reductions can be many. You can use axial traction. Um, you can use closed uh, manipulation. Um, you can use chance pins. Um, I like the AO uh, uh, universal compressor distractor, or some people would call it the femoral distractor, uh, to reduce. Uh, when you're reducing open um, clamps, uh, chance pins, and combinations thereof uh, can be very effective for obtaining a direct reduction of the sacrum. And again, iliosacral screw fixation, I think is, is very, very important. Dr. Rout had, had demonstrated to us um, the understanding of osseous fixation pathways and the morphology and variation uh, to wit that exists within the posterior pelvic ring. And I think understanding of that is absolutely paramount um, if you're going to be instrumenting uh, these uh, patients. Uh, reduction, again, it can't be understated how important reduction is. Uh, we now have availability implants and technology to do transiliac transsacral uh, fixation. And whenever that's possible, I like to do that so long as the sacral morphology uh, allows me uh, to do that. Multiple screws, if the osseous fixation pathways are large enough to accept and contain multiple screws safely, and then coupled with anterior fixation, which James had talked about earlier. Here's an example of a rotationally unstable uh, sacral uh, or a, a fracture. This is a 25-year-old uh, female who was in a motor vehicle crash. She was a restrained driver in T-bone, and she had an extra foraminal or, or Denis I uh, sacral fracture, which was painful on compression. And um, when you look at her original x-rays, it, it really doesn't look like much, but she had come in on a Friday, and we tried to mobilize her over the weekend. This was an isolated injury. Tried to mobilize her over the weekend and, and her pain was too great. She couldn't roll from side to side. She couldn't get up to the edge of the bed. Um, and um, we took her uh, for, an, uh, for an EUA um, that following Monday. And when you see with an inlet view and just a little bit uh, of lateral directed force, you can see uh, quite a bit of uh, mobility. And I know there are a lot of questions as to how much mobility warrants fixation, and maybe we can cover that in question and answer here at the end. Uh, but she was one where we had secured her sacral fracture um, with iliosacral screws. Um, her, we used a, a sacral style screw in her second segment and a, and a sacroiliac style screw in her upper segment, uh, coupled with anterior fixation. And this is a woman in the PACU who told us that she was much better, got up and mobilized uh, very nicely afterward. For vertically unstable uh, fractures, you can either use closed or open reduction uh, techniques. Uh, again, for me, iliosacral screw fixation is the mainstay uh, for these vertically unstable fractures coupled with anterior fixation. 
Uh, lumbopelvic fixation for comminution is certainly a possibility, and we'll talk about some examples of that as well. This is a 66-year-old that was uh, presented to our institution who was in a motor vehicle crash and was hemodynamically unstable on arrival. And she had just happened to arrive at our institution about three in the morning. Uh, she was um, uh, placed into distal femoral traction. Um, they had wrapped her in a sheet. Um, the trauma team was very aggressive with her resuscitation overnight, but really just couldn't uh, keep up with her needs. Um, you can see that she has a, um, a, an extra foraminal comminuted sacral fracture with a very large, in my opinion, upper sacral segment with some uh, displacement. And so it just so happened that we had a room available and, and we took, uh, took her to the operating room uh, the next day. It placed in uh, distal femoral traction with just a little bit of skeletal paralysis, which allowed a sufficient reduction for placement of screws in, in kind of a resuscitative style like uh, Connor had just spoken about, first a partially threaded and then uh, two fully threaded upper segment screws to secure her comminuted sacral fracture coupled with anterior fixation. Uh, serve to be uh, both resuscitative and definitive fixation uh, for this patient after a closed manipulative reduction. Um, we, we've talked about this study at least three times so far in this course, and, and I think it's a very important one. Uh, and I think Dr. Rout had talked last week about um, the importance also of, of obtaining reduction um, when you're placing screws. And so your, your malreduction limits your safe area uh, considerably, and so there's no there's no amount of um, uh, fluoro or navigation, fancy tables or frames that will substitute for sweet reduction. And so I think uh, I think that this is uh, very important for you all who are just starting out in your careers or considering um, being pelvic fracture surgeons. Um, about two decades ago, this is a paper that sort of sticks out to me that was was part of my um, that sort of. Um, resonates with me in my education, being as how I, th I think that um, fixation for common, especially vertically unstable sacral fractures, got a lot of bad publicity a couple of a couple of decades ago. Uh, and in understanding that this was um, a biopsy, really of the available techniques, uh, technology, implants, and understanding uh, at the time. And um, um, at the time, for example, we didn't have uh, screws sufficient to pass uh, into the contralateral ilium to provide transiliac transsacral fractures. We we're using partially threaded screws that were docked in the ala. And remember how I said earlier that those ALAR segments are relatively osteopenic. Um, and so while it can be hazardous, I think that we have um, a little bit better understanding uh, now almost uh, 20 years later. Um, about these injuries. And so for me, um, it's iliosacral screws are still the mainstay uh, of my fixation. Um, when they aren't the mainstay of fixation, I think you have to consider lumbopelvic uh, fixation, uh, not only for comminuted sacral fractures, but those uh, sacral fractures that uh, have a lumbopelvic dissociation as part of their injury pattern. They need to be reduced just like any other fracture, and this can be closed or open. Um, you can use lumbopelvic fixation. You can still use some iliosacral fixation. I'll show you an example of that. And, and you can use so-called triangular fixation. And we'll talk about what that means. Um, this, is a, um, this is a study uh, from Harborview from uh, um, Sean Nork and Chip Rout. And they had talked about there are 13 patients with minimally displaced U-shaped sacral fractures. And it highlighted an important radiologic aspect of U-shaped uh, sacral fractures in as much as these patients present with a paradoxical inlet, meaning that if you get an AP pelvic radiograph, the posterior ring will look like an inlet at the same time that you have a, uh, an AP on the anterior pelvis. Uh, they had performed iliosacral screw fixation um, without reduction. These are patients that had a minimal amount of kyphosis that was present. Um, there was no change. All of these patients healed. And if you notice the x-ray from the paper, they had placed uh, sacral style screws uh, from one side um, and then a second sacral style screw from the other. And that's because we didn't have implants that were long enough uh, to do transiliac transsacral fixation uh, at the time. Uh, what we've extrapolated from that in the modern era is that we can use transiliac transsacral fixation with our longer screws. As an example, the 62 year old male uh, presents with pain after a fall, no neurologic deficits. I think if you look closely on this AP pelvic radiograph or this, this two-dimensional reconstruction that you can see uh, that it looks like an AP pelvis in the front, but looks like an inlet sacrum 
uh, on the posterior aspect. Axial cut is at your bottom right, and, and I've, I've turned the um, CT scan on the, um, on the left side here to understand that if you had an AP view, notice how the kyphosis will give you, give you an inlet look at the posterior pelvic ring at the, son, at the same time that you have an AP of the anterior pelvic ring. He was taken for um, a transiliac transsacral fixation, and this is just this is a, a procedure for these minimally displaced fractures, just to provide some stability and comfort uh, to allow your patients to mobilize uh, when they need it. Sometimes the disruption is a little bit more dramatic, and you need some lumbopelvic fixation. This often um, this always uh, requires an open exposure, uh, often with a need for reduction, uh, frequently with a need for sacral decompression. Connor had talked about um, the possibilities of reduction of the sacroiliac joint, and he'd, he'd stated that he favored uh, an anterior exposure, um, and there's a posterior exposure that exists as well. And while the anterior exposure uh, gives you the um, advantage of being able to instrument, manipulate, and, and um, address the entire pelvic ring, the posterior exposure uh, doesn't do that. But there is no such thing as a safe anterior exposure for a sacrum. If you're exposing a sacrum, uh, you're going posterior. Otherwise, it is just not safe. Here's an example from our institution of an 18-year-old male um, who had uh, jumped uh, from a bridge with severe instability. He had some pre-existing uh, sacral uh, deformity uh, and a syrinx in his sacral canal. And notice that he just doesn't have osseous fixation pathways uh, that are available uh, for uh, iliosacral screw insertion. Uh, he was taken um, with me and one of my spine colleagues who just happens to be one of my best friends and so we operate together um, and um, if you have spine colleagues that are your friends you can help them by uh, placing iliac bolts because you will be better at that than they are and, and they can place your, your uh, lumbar pedicle screws because they will be better at it uh, than you are uh, very likely. Posterior exposure has advantages because it gives complete access to the posterior ring and decompression of neurologic injuries when you need it. The disadvantages sometimes are that the patient is prone and the soft tissues uh, can be somewhat problematic. Historically, in the 1980s, um, there were papers that had discussed even up to about a 25% uh, wound complication rate. Um, but several of our papers in the more modern era, especially uh, one of my favorites is from Stover and Sims, which would demonstrate that a more careful dissection uh, of the uh, posterior pelvic ring uh, can lead to a wound complication that is much lower and much more acceptable. Um, you, have, you have videos um, at, to uh, demonstrate the posterior exposures to you, and so I'm not gonna do it and uh, couple that with the hopefully live uh, cadaveric dissections that we can have, and so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, linger on this too much, but the posterior exposure um, really necessitates careful soft tissue handling. Stover and Sims had described elevating a medial full thickness cutaneous flap and elevating the gluteus maximus uh, off of its connection to the posterior superior iliac spine as well as the fascia of the erector spinae and developing that full uh, thickness uh, flap. And so uh, check your videos and hopefully um, if the pestilence is, has retreated, we can, we can do these uh, live. Um, this is an example of a 48-year-old male with a fall from a roof and sacral uh, nerve root deficits. And this is uh, what I think is referred to commonly as triangular osteosynthesis, where my spine partner had placed um, his lumbopelvic fixation coupled with uh, iliosacral screw fixation. And this was done because the patient um, had a sufficient osseous fixation pathway to accept and contain that upper segment screw safely. Um, so iliolumbar fixation coupled with um, SI screw, I think, is, is commonly um, discussed as triangular osteosynthesis. Uh, Schildauer and Rout from Journal of, Trauma, uh, Journal of Orthopedic Trauma in 2003 uh, had uh, studied these in, in cadaveric uh, specimens. And again, this was just, uh, just uh, kind of harvesting information from the implants that we had at the time. We didn't have terribly long uh, iliosacral screws uh, to be used. And so what they had found is that in triangular osteosynthesis, uh, the peak displacement um, with loads of these cadaveric specimens was much lower in their triangular osteosynthesis specimens uh, versus their iliosacral screw uh, specimens alone. Um, so those are fractures that are associated with pelvic ring injuries. 
Zone three fractures or midline fractures without instability below the second sacral segment do not affect lumbar pelvic stability and don't affect stability of the of the um, pelvic ring. And so um, sometimes the occasionally these need to be instrumented as well. Sometimes there is severe um, uh, sacral nerve root deficits. Occasionally uh, these are open and the posterior exposure in the midline region elevating the erector spinae uh, can lead you uh, to uh, a, a wide exposure of the posterior sacrum and allow for reduction in instrumentation frequently uh, with smaller plates. Just a couple of um, um, other techniques that are available uh, to secure the posterior pelvic ring uh, or posterior plating. I, I don't do this um, in my practice, but I know some of our more um, experienced and, and seasoned um, faculty members uh, do do this uh, operation. Um, it requires uh, open exposure, prone positioning. Um, and um, I, I think the reason that I don't do this is that I'd learned uh, uh, with uh, iliosacral screws and, and it just hasn't been part of my education, but still a very viable option uh, for uh, posterior ring uh, instrumentation uh, when needed. Uh, transiliac bars are also historically um, um, a uh, option for uh, posterior pelvic ring uh, fixation. Uh, really the only contraindication is when you have lumbopelvic uh, dissociation and if the posterior ala doesn't provide sufficient clearance uh, of the sacrum to allow for these bars to be safely placed. And so I think you have to carefully assess your patients um, if you're going to use uh, posterior uh, transiliac bars. The outcomes, and this is where, this is where uh, the soft tissues are important. There are a lot of retrospective studies associated with it. Um, the outcomes really correlate more with soft tissue injury uh, than the bony problem, and most specifically nerve injuries. Um, uh, bowel and bladder dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, and soft tissue complications and infections that can result of which. Chronic pain doesn't seem to be much of a, as big of an issue as it used to be uh, in the modern era, and uh, non-union uh, of these sacral fractures is really rather rare uh, with internal fixation coupled with sufficient reduction. So to finalize, we described and classified sacral fractures. You have many uh, options for uh, sacral fracture classification. We talked about reduction op options, and those include open and closed uh, techniques. Uh, fixation, I think the mainstay, at least in my practice, and maybe for most in North America, is iliosacral screw fixation. Uh, you can also use lumbar pelvic fixation. You can use tension band plates, posterior uh, transiliac bars, uh, and, and uh, other options may exist. Um, and the soft tissue envelope, um, just, like, um, just like any other fracture, I think that maintaining a uh, a um, respect for the soft tissue envelope and careful handling will maximize your outcomes. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Uh, that was excellent. Uh, we have a few minutes uh, for questions. Uh, Mark, uh, Steve. Sorry about that. I was uh, typing, typing an answer. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of uh, questions that have come in regarding order of reduction, order of fixation. And obviously that's gonna, it's gonna change. The answer is gonna change significantly depending upon the injury that we're talking about. But let's just say uh, order, of, order of reduction and fixation for a comminuted sacral fracture in association with a symphysis dislocation versus a uh, patient maybe with a bilateral completely displaced sacroiliac joint injuries with bilateral rami fractures. So how would the panel approach those differently in terms of sequencing? Or would you? Connor, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I, so let me take your example, Mark, of a, uh, of a, um, a comminuted sacral fracture with symphyseal disruption. Um, um, I think to... This to me um, is a injury that uh, there's very little doubt that, that I think um, folks would recommend fixation of both the anterior and posterior lesions of the pelvic ring. And, and so typically my sequence for that is the patient is supine on a midline lumbosacral bump, um, an anterior exposure, uh, um, fan and steel exposure of the symphysis pubis um, with an anatomic reduction um, of that symphysis pubis and temporary uh, fixation with a clamp. Um, frequently, although not always, frequently 
that is enough to realign your posterior pelvic ring to allow for a percutaneous uh, fixation of that of that sacral fracture. And so, it, in my mind, with with that injury constellation, I'm I'm directly reducing the anterior ring, um, and and very frequently that posterior ring will follow that anterior reduction. And if it doesn't, and if it doesn't, that's a great question. So I'll I'll, I'll apply a plate. And if it's a, a comminuted sacral fracture, it makes for a long day. Um, you you have to close up anteriorly, place the patient for me prone, uh, exposure of that uh, sacrum fracture, and then um, secure from there. Are you concerned that placing the plate on the symphysis might block your ability to reduce the sacrum? For, for sure. And so if I'm going to use if I'm going to use that kind of fixation, I'm going to use something that's flexible. I'm probably not going to put my definitive fixation. Uh, there when that happens. Um, maybe just a little two-hole plate, if anything. Maybe I'm just going to leave that alone, too, um, is a thing, depending on the amount of displacement that's present. Yeah, I think I agree a lot with, with Ray. If you think about it like any other fracture where you have multiple breakpoints, and so if you have something simple that you can clamp uh, and have anatomic, then you can fix that, whether that's a simple ramus fracture or a symphysis or if you wanna leave it as a hinge point. And so just remember that typically your posterior fixation will not flex, whether that's you know, iliosacral screws, which is typically the workhorse, or, if, or particularly if you have spinal pelvic fixation, but the anterior fixation, you potentially can have something that's relatively malleable, but the posterior fixation, once that's in, it's unlikely that your pelvic ring will be able to hinge around that. And typically, it's uh, if you're doing, like, for example, Mark, you brought up the point of comminuted rami fractures where you may not have a good read. And if you start posteriorly and, and reduce that, that's a, it's a much more complicated reduction, um, typically an error of external rotation deformity because you're clamping posteriorly. And so if you, if you have something in the front that you can put a hinge point with something relatively malleable, uh, that you can rotate off of um, that may be beneficial to you. But I, I would just sort of think about it like any other fracture where you may have multiple clamps on at the same time. Um, but just to know that once you put your posterior fixation in, and if you put iliosacral screws in, it's unlikely you're going to rotate the ring off of those to reduce the anterior ring. I think the only difference um, that I don't think either would mention is I think anchoring the pelvis to the table, whatever way, if it's just a simple X fix that you can attach to the table, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, but using a chance pin in the hemi pelvis in the AIIS uh, sciatic buttress corridor, I think that uh, is super helpful to kind of address all of the planes uh, in addition to skeletal traction. So I think those are the other things that I would do, but totally agree with um, clamping and either provisional uh, plating the front and even getting the provisional wire in posteriorly, at least one to kind of help maintain things so you can kind of go back and forth and manipulate it. Okay, yeah. so to summarize in that, in that particular case, some type of using the anterior ring reduction as an indirect reduction of the posterior pelvic ring sets you up hopefully for a, a more percutaneous or closed treatment of the sacral fracture. But if it doesn't work, then leaving the anterior ring fixation a little flexible so that you still have some room to work for the reduction of the posterior pelvic ring. What about the second scenario of the bilateral completely displaced SI joints with rami fractures? Uh, again, where you, your anterior read and the rami may be unreliable. And again, we're talking about sequencing. Yeah, so for that one, I would, you know, you may need open reductions. And I would, again, think about it like other fractures where if, if you have a more uh, or a, a less severe disruption of an SI joint, start with that one because error is additive. So, uh, you know, as you sequentially perform reductions, you can assume that your error rate will go up. And so starting with the most simple uh, and by simple, I mean the least displaced or the least, uh, you know, mal, uh, distracted injury. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And try to build back to that around the ring. Um, and so sometimes you may have sort of a partial SI joint disruption that you can get, you know, pretty darn accurate. 
And then maybe from there, you may then clamp a, a ramus fracture and, and try to reconstruct back to what, you know, going from simple to most, most complex in terms of your injury and displacement. The same oh, way as a sorry, Taylor neck or a both bone where you're just building from simpler to more complex where you, you've got multiple injuries and you just build them up so that the overall reduction is as anatomic as possible. Good. And, but in that situation, it sounds like all of you would favor at least beginning with the posterior pelvic ring, with attempting a reduction of the posterior pelvic ring, rather than going to the front and trying to use the reduction of the rami as an indirect reduction of the SI joints. Yes. Yeah. I would. I mean, SI joints aren't very tolerable of malreduction, so you got you have to get those right for sure. And I think the comminuted rami fractures would just make that more challenging to get right if you're using that as your reduction gauge. Mark, one point, I don't know if I, I was a little bit unclear, if the, if the anterior fixation, we talked about what kind of fixation, I would say, you know, if you have a, you know, like a reconstruction plate that has a, you know, a minimal amount of screws or even a 2.7 reconstruction plate, you can, you can bend a ring around that. But if you put a 7.0 cannulated screw down a pubic root fracture or ramus fracture, that's much more difficult to rotate around if you're if you're doing the strategy of doing the front first. So, okay, uh, great, uh, Steve. Anything you want to ask, or was there any questions that you saw from the question? Yeah, I just this this should be a, hopefully a very quick question since we're rightly out of time. So, but it came up repeatedly, and that is, what, what do you do with your patients postoperatively? as far as mobilization and weight bearing. So let's maybe take the scenario of a rotationally unstable injury first, and then take the one of a globally unstable hemipelvis and how do you manage that patient or if they're bilateral? I, th I think if they're, if I may answer, if it's rotationally unstable and I've, I've fixed a patient, uh, uh, oftentimes I'll let them uh, weight bear is tolerated or, or do protected weight bearing um, through whichever side of the injury is present. If they're bilateral posterior pelvic rings, oftentimes I'll let them uh, weight bear just for transfers um, to protect them. And it, I guess it kind of depends on what the bilateral injury is too. If it's a comminuted, uh, displaced, vertically unstable thing, oftentimes I'll, I'll make them weight of limb weight bearing on that side once it's secured. Does that answer your question? I usually let rotationally uh, unstable ones that are fixed, weight bear is tolerated, but otherwise agree with what Ray said. Anybody anything different? No, I, I'm very, very similar. It, each one, you get a feeling of the fixation and the stability during the operation. And so that's how I try to make my decision between protecting their weight bearing after surgery and letting them weight bear. But if it's good fixation and a rotationally unstable injury that is well stabilized afterwards, I will let them weight bear, but I encourage them to listen to their symptoms and I don't, weight bearing is tolerated is not, you must weight bear. It's, it's based on your symptoms. Yeah, it really, really depends on the injury. I'll make just a side comment that there is some data that if, if you're in the setting of spinal pelvic fixation, that uh, yeah. is some data that that is a construct that it, at least uh, from the European data, allows uh, weight bearing is tolerated immediately. So I think it really goes down to you know what you're fixing and, and then what kind of patient. Uh, I think we've all had people that have failed fixation, whether they had uh, you know um, different mental health problems or, or, or what. So I think you got to be really careful uh, understanding what kind of injury and the severity of injury that you're that you're treating. Okay, yeah, that's great. Um... We've had uh, excellent uh, questions uh, from the participants. Uh, appreciate and thank the faculty for uh, their great talks today. And really, this is a foundation both last week and this week uh, going forward. Next week, we're going to have uh, uh, faculty presenting five to six cases over our 90-minute session. And hopefully uh, a lot of the questions that came up today will be addressed with those questions. I think uh, just for summary today, we'll, we'll talk about Brett's talk with decision making, uh, obviously determining uh, which ones to uh, operate on is not always easy. Uh, the examination under anesthesia is uh, sometimes indicated and useful. 
uh, anterior and posterior fixation is uh, required in some injury patterns. And the order of fixation, as we just talked about, is based on the injury and uh, what your evaluation is, uh, both intraoperatively and preoperatively. And it's important to avoid residual displacement. With regards to James' talk, the anterior pelvic ring, there's multiple methods of anterior ring fixation. The reduction of the anterior ring may facilitate posterior ring reduction, but as we just discussed in the case scenario, uh, it may block your posterior reduction. So you have to be careful uh, with regards to the uh, anterior fixation in the setting of a posterior ring injury. And obviously stabilization of the anterior ring augments fixation of the posterior ring. With regards to the sacroiliac joint, uh, Connor gave an excellent talk about decision-making and using the uh, concept of linear reduction vectors, using percutaneous versus open techniques based on reduction that you see in the operating room and the injury pattern. And of course, there's multiple techniques for both reduction and fixation. Finally, uh, Ray gave an excellent talk on sacral fractures and determining whether the sacral fracture is part of the pelvic ring or part of the spine. There's multiple classification systems that are available for, for these sacral fractures. And the methods of stabilization are directed by these injury patterns, both uh, in some cases non-operative, sometimes percutaneous screws, and in, uh, in some instances when you have more severe injuries, spinal pelvic fixation. And it's important to pay attention to the soft tissues because they often will dictate the outcome. So your homework assignment uh, for this week will be both to review the lectures from today and last week. You had three excellent talks last week. This is a uh, link on AO uh, North America trauma uh, for the surgical approaches. You can just take a few minutes to do a screen save there. Or a few seconds, I should say, not a few minutes. And uh, a link will be sent to you in the next 24 hours, uh, linking you to these uh, videos and the talks through AR, AO Trauma North America on YouTube. And then a link to the recording, of course, will be sent to those that have registered. And this is our outline for the coming weeks. Next week will be an expert panel discussion, as I mentioned, it'll be five to six cases. Uh, really dealing with all the uh, types of pelvic ring injuries that we tend to see. And then in the coming weeks, we'll uh, start dealing with acetabular fractures, as you can see there. So I'd like to thank the speakers, the, the faculty for answering questions during the session. And uh, we've gone a little over today, but I think it's been an excellent uh, session. And uh, please tune in next week uh, for uh, the third installment uh, of this uh, pelvic and acetabular management course. Thank you.